Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing another episode of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at a bunch of different mods people have been making over the past couple weeks or so so I'm really excited to get stuck into this one. So this one is really interesting because this will be coming out the same day as the Safari Pack that uh, Nick has been releasing. So this has a lot of species that have already come from this pack so I thought it'd be perfect to show it off the day he released it. It's just one of those happy accidents that always happen to me sometimes. It's really cool. And this one part 35, so we're already making a lot of progress. So I'm really, really happy with some of the mods we got here today. Some really interesting animals. And to start, off, start us off today, we have got by my homegirl uh, Ron Mayron or Rihanna. We have got a couple of her birds. So we'll be starting with the first bird that she made. We have got the California quail. So we get a look at a nice guy here. Look at that wonderful guy. So the California quail, also known as the, the valley quail or the uh, California quail, there are small species uh, that are ground dwelling that are uh, new world quails uh, from that family. So related things like bob whites and things. And you can see they have this really interesting curved uh, crest or a plume, that's what it's called. And it's made of six feathers that drop forward on the males. But if we can find a female, they don't really have this characteristic plume. It's very sexually dimorphic. So only one sex really has it. Still looks wonderful regardless. And you can see the males are like grayish with flashes of white. And as we looked before, the females here, here she is. She is quite drab and brown. Still looks beautiful. She is a beautiful queen, of course. But, um... You can see the differences here. The uh, the female and mature birds, you can see they're mainly grey-brown with those light, light belly. But you can see the mature males are a lot more greyish with the plume and all that. But the closest living relative is the uh, Gambles quail that is found more south and have a longer crest than two and a half inches. Uh, a brighter head and a scalier appearance. And the two species were related, uh, that are related, but they're separated by one or two million years of evolution from the late Pleistocene, or late Pliocene to early Pleistocene. And they are the state bird of California. And so that's another fun little fact about them. So, obviously these guys are from California, and they are a highly social bird that often gathers in small flocks, known as covers, where they'll do daily communal activities, such as dust baths and things. And a group of quails will select an area of ground which is nearly tuned soft and using the underbellies will burrow into the soft soil and kind of mix it up in them and have a great big old bird bath. That's wonderful. So they can create pretty big uh, little uh, bowls in these dust baths, like some 15 to 7 to 15 centimeters or 2.8 to 5.9 inches in diameter. So... Yeah, pretty, pretty cool guys. Uh, they're also year-round residents in these places. They coexist people with urban areas, but some areas they are definitely declining. They originally were found ma mainly in the southwestern United States, such as California and places like that, but have been introduced to lots of places around the world, such as British Columbia, Hawaii, Chile, Uruguay, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, South Africa, New Zealand, and to Norfolk Island and King Island of Australia. We'll have a look. We'll have a look at some females while we're talking about them. That's, these are babies. we will talk about the females. Yeah, look at these wonderful queens. So, um, they seem to forage on the ground where they scratch at the soil and try and find... Their diet is mainly consisted of seeds and leaves, but they will often find some berries and insects that they will eat. And if started, they'll explode into a short, rapid flight that they call flushing, and will normally escape on foot if given the chance. That's just how they are. So... Their breeding habitat is usually scrubby areas in open woodland uh, found in Western North America where they will make a nest that is uh, shallowly scraped in the line with vegetation or the ground beneath with a bunch of different cover and stuff and lay approximately up to 12 eggs. Once hatched, the young will associate, its, uh, associate with both adults and often these fam family groups will create these like communal broods where they will have at least two females, multiple males and a lot of offspring so they kind of raise them together. So males um, associated with families are not always the genetic fathers and in good years the females will lay more than one clutch leaving the hatch young with the associated male and laying the next clutch open with a different associated male. So they will lay as much as they can, they're very boom or bust. 
And they also have a variety of really cool socializations, include the Chicago Call, uh, Contact Pips, and Warning Pips that they use during the, uh, obviously, these contact and social and warning uh, situations. And during the breeding season, the male will also utter an antagonistic squill, which often uh, interrupts the males, the social males, and they use it as kind of a way to get each other angry and fight each other, so that's pretty cool. So yeah, really wonderful little bird here, Ron, uh, Ray Ron, or Ray Arnes, and she did a very wonderful job. I really am a big fan of her birds. Speaking of Rihanna's birds, we've, as I mentioned, we've got another one. So we have got another little funny guy, so another cool little bird. We have got the uh, Temrix uh, uh, Tragopan. So let's have a look at, let's see if we can find a male here. That's a female. Find the male. Juvenile. Oh, there we are. There's the male. There we are. Wonderful guy here. So the Temrix uh, Tapragan is a medium-sized pheasant. They get to about 64 centimeters long, and they obviously are related to other tragopans. So you can see the male here has got a very, very uh, red and orange uh, bird. You can see he's got all these white spots along him as well. Uh, black bill and pink legs. You can see he's got this blue, uh, the, this bare blue facial skin that is actually inflatable, um, as well with the uh, dark billed lampet that's like a little uh, flesh of skin that you can inflate that they use for displays. Obviously, you can't really show it here unless it had a new animation, but it is able to inflate that to add some beautiful colors to help it with mating. And uh, the females, comparatively, are always a little bit more drab. We can find a female around here. That's a juvenile, but we'll find a female. See, the female's a little bit more drab. It's a beautiful queen, though, of course. And they do resemble another closely related species of uh, trapagan called the um, Sato trapagan. But usually, but unlike them, they have all reddish upper body plumage and an orange collar. And their diet itself is mainly consistent of berries, grass, and plants. But I'm assuming, like a lot of other animals, they will supplement them with uh, insects and berries and things. So, pretty, pretty generalist. And you can see here, they've got these spurs that they use for fighting, which is pretty interesting. Um, the Temrix range is usually found in the mountains of far northeast India, central China, far northern Myanmar, and northwest Tolkien, or Tonkin. But luckily, they are widespread in the common species with a very large habitat range, so they are considered at least concerned by the IUCN. And um, their bird's name, as you can see, the the name came from the Dutch nationalist um, Karad Jacob uh, Temrix. So that's a lot of these older species are described by the naturalists who found them, or often in tribute to a naturalist that found them. So this guy was a Dutch uh, a naturalist. Still a really, really cool animal. The only thing I would love to see is maybe a special animation that you can inflate the um, uh, lampet. That would be awesome, but I don't think we're there yet. So, Rihanna, I'm going to say it again, you did a wonderful job. Really wonderful species. Uh, Tragopans are kind of those animals that are not that well known, but you did them justice, and I like them. Ooh, wonderful guy. So now we're going to move on to the next species. So this one is done by... Two are probably the most prolific modders in the uh, scene. We have got the... This is by Leaf and Nicholas Ryder. We have got the Sulcata tortoise. So we'll have a look at the male here. Really wonderful animal. Wonderful big male. So the Sulcata tor tortoise, also known as the African Spurred tortoise, is a species of tortoise that lives around the edge of the Sahara Desert in Africa. And is quite famous for being the third largest uh, tortoise species in the world second only to the Adabra and Galapagos tortoises, but those are both island species, so this is the largest species that you can find on the mainland, being found, as I mentioned, in Africa. So their habitat uh, usually covers around Sahul, where they live in lots of grasslands and savannas and scrublands, and a lot of the uh, countries that they can be found in is in Burkina Faso, in uh, the Central African Republic, Chad, Ethiopia, uh, lots of those African countries, including Somalia and the Cameroon, and is possibly um, taken out or extirpated from countries such as Dugabult and Toga. It's just really, really cool. 
And in these regions, these very arid regions, they excavate burrows uh, that they can uh, in the ground to get to areas of high moisture and spend the hottest part of the days in these burrows. And this process is known, uh, they are known to also uh, partake in estivation in the wild. So they burrow quite deep and kind of just chill out for a bit. And they can dig very, very deep burrows that can be up to 15 meters deep and 30 meters long. So that's huge. Uh, plants such as grasses and succulents grow around their burrows if they keep them moist, which also is a bit, is they're kind of like a megafauna. What they'll do is also their poop will feed uh, a lot of these species of plants that live around their burrows. So kind of it feeds themselves. It's a really interesting cycle. And uh, as I mentioned, third largest tortoise, they can get up to, I think the largest one was about 83 centimeters in length and about 98 kilograms, but others state they can get to about 105 kilograms or 231 pounds. And they grow very quickly from their hatch size, which is about two or three inches and reaching six to 10 inches within their first years of life and can live for more than 70 years. So as I mentioned, the Sulcata tortoise is primarily herbivore. They usually feed on grasses, plants that are high in fiber, also flowers and things especially things like kale and stuff and uh, they usually breed right after rain see the rainy season so that's about in september through november and males will compete with each other because they have these big spurs here that they use to fight and compete with each other and they'll ram each other and usually um after five or fifteen days four or five nests may be excavated before after mating she will make these nests and she selects the perfect location for her eggs so what she does is kick up the loose soil and even they will urinate in these depressions to try and uh, make it moist enough to then to dig easy. And once they reach about two feet deep, deep and about three to six inches in diameter, they will make a further depression that measures about eight inches or 20 centimeters across. They'll dug out and what they'll use is they it takes about five hours for them to dig the nest and then what they'll do is lay their eggs in them. And uh, it usually takes the ambient air at least uh, 27 degrees. Uh, and once the nest is dug, the female begins to lay an egg every three minutes. And clutches may contain up to 15 to 30 or more eggs. And after the eggs are laid, the female will fill the nest, taking an hour more to fully cover it and to go do her own thing. And the incubation usually is about 86 uh, uh, to 88 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not sure the exact calculation. Uh, probably about 30 degrees uh, Celsius. And uh, take about 900 and 290 to 120 days to... Uh, Fully incubate so yeah really wonderful tortoise a pretty common pet too but you always got to remember especially if they're a common pet they're not that little cute little tortoise that you get at the pet shop they can get enormous so be careful and plus they live for 70 years it's a very long time so you'll probably be leaving that in your will still a really wonderful animal so as I mentioned that was by leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider so the next one will be and one just by leaf another this was also part of the africa pack the next one as well is going to be part of the africa pack i believe so we've got a really cool little monkey here done by leaf so we have got the the buzzers monkey look at this wonderful guy i love his white beard and the sad thing is um the new world monkeys have these curled tails, but old world monkeys don't, so that's just a little inaccuracy. So, the Debuzzus monkey is an old world monkey that is endemic to the riverine and swamp forests of Central Africa, and is the largest in the uh, Gunon family and in one of the most widespread African primates. Apart from its size, you can tell it apart because it has this open didenum, like a forehead patch of cool fur, and this big white beard. And it's sadly not well documented in all its habitats. But they have shown unique traits such as pair bonding and aggressive behavior towards other Juno monkeys. So they're also very, very sexual, sexually selective. The most sexually selective of all the Gnome monkeys. The males, oh, that was a bit of a bug there, but the uh, males weigh about 7 kilograms, but the females about 4 kilograms. Adults will have green, uh, gray agouti fur with their reddish brown back that you can see here. Black, uh, black limbs. Uh, and a tail and a black limbs a tail and a white rump you can see here and both sexes have these cheek pouches that they use to carry food uh while they forage and the males also you can't really see it here but they have a very distinctive blue scrotum while the females have a red uh preanal region and visible nipples so sadly you can't really see that because it's not that explicit in these mods but that's okay we'll have a look at another one while we're talking about them <laughs> 
So um, juveniles, as you can see here, they lack a lot of these uh, extreme features. They seem to be sexually or a symbol of age. So you can see a young one here lacks a lot of these uh, distinguishing uh, colors and beards and stuff. This looks very cute regardless. So let's have a look at another male again, or a big one. Quite cute. So the bats and monkeys are found all around the swamps, uh, bamboo and dry mountain forests from Angola, uh, like basically just Central Africa, such as the Congo, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, South Sudan, Uganda, and a lot of those Central uh, African countries. And they are... They usually are found, they're considered swamp monkeys, so they're found usually exclusively near water. They're never really about one kilometer away from a tributary. And uh, they result, they can be seen swimming, though they prefer de dense forests and vegetation, only venturing into more open forests to feed. And the monkeys prefer, um, they're mainly arboreal, but they will descend from the ground to feed on herbaceous plants. And their cryptid nature, nature there's not really a great estimation size for their population. So as I mentioned, they eat pretty much a lot of uh, herbaceous plants in the forest, but they will eat f uh, f on the forest floor and flutes when available. They will also supplement their diet with insects, seeds, and other food sources like other animals will. A lot of animals are very, very uh, generalist in terms of their uh, diet. And uh, the lifespan of these guys considered to be up to 22 years in the wild and 13 captivity. And, of course, the crypt of nature makes it hard to observe. But we see they have small troop sizes that average about 2 to 10 individuals. And in some areas of Western Africa, such as Gabon and Cameroon, uh, small uh, po bear ponder groups such as a male and female infants and juveniles have been observed. And in Eastern Africa, the Debezes monkey live in single male groups, with multi-females as well. And um, societies do not create these bachelor groups and occasionally dispose uh, alpha male to take over the female so usually the male is the big boss of course and uh, males would communicate with these booming sounds and they usually are heard early in the morning when the male calls out to establish his territory but they will also use this call to bring the group back if they get separated they also will use it when they get attacked by predators such as crown eagles also leopards uh, common chimpanzees are another common pre pre predator also humans what they'll do is they'll do a big call and they will uh, um, there'll be a short bark that they before attacking the eagle or to scare it off or if not they will just try and hide females have been also observed to give alarm calls and growls of humans and otherwise the female uh, locus uh, vocalizations are limited to quiet croaks given to when they're feeding or resting also uh, infants juveniles will give uh, squeals and distress and things like that but a lot over time they'll kind of uh, grow into these uh, vocalizations, so it's pretty cool. Also for reproduction, these guys reach sexual maturity at about five years of age, while the males do not mature until they are closer to six years of age. Most juvenile males will leave their natal group or the group that they are born with. We'll have a look at another one. We'll have a look at one eating or grooming. Look at this cutie. Ooh, his face is a bit messed up. But you know how it is. So they'll leave their natal group or the group that they were born in uh, by the time they reach sexual maturity. And the breeding season usually lasts from February to March, where the females can go into oestrus at any time if there's a lot of food available. Gestation for these guys as well lasts about five to six months, and the infant will stay close to its mother for the first year of life, at which point it will be weaned. And females usually have one infant at a time, but often, well, not often, but really twins can be born with year-long interbirth intervals. So usually they'll have a baby, then next year might have a baby, just depending on how uh, much food there is at the time. Really wonderful animals here. So um, luckily they are listed as deep, uh, least concerned with the IUCN, but the main threats that these guys face, obviously in being in Central Africa, is deforestation, uh, including from logging and agri agriculture. Also bushmeat trade is another big issue for them. And uh, there are several captive populations across Europe and North America, that's good. And usually they aren't, they are managed kind of like a species plan, but they're not listed as vulnerable or endangered. It's just because there may be some issues in the future uh, to, that could be like retroactive. So they're kind of planning ahead because being obviously in Africa and in a, in a rainforest with specialized habitats, it could be an issue in the future. They are still wonderful monkeys, and they are great. So that was by Leaf. Next one, we've got someone a bit bigger than a 
A bit bigger than a monkey, we have got a giraffe, as you can see here. This was made by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider as well, so we got a pretty big animal here. So, this is one of the three species of giraffe now. I'm going to explain a little bit of the taxonomy. There used to be one giraffe species with eight subspecies. So now there is kind of considered three or four subspe uh, species, not subspecies, four species of giraffe. And the southern one, or the kind of eastern one, is considered the uh, Maasai giraffe. So Giraffa um, tripaskili, which is two subspecies. I think it's the uh, Maasai giraffe, as you see here, and the Angolan, or maybe it's one of the other subspecies. There's two subspecies in this. So that's why it's considered three species, maybe four species. The reticulated giraffe might be its own species, since it's reproductively isolated from the other giraffe populations or subspecies. But this is considered basically one species. So this is Giraffa um, tripaskelli. So these guys are pretty well distinguished from other sub, uh, species of giraffes. They have this very, very charismatic kind of like jagged spots along their body. That as large males, as they get older, it kind of gets darker and they kind of look darker. And they are geographically ranged across southern Kenya and all of Tanzania. And that's why you get the genetic evidence that there are different species. They're also the largest um, species of giraffe. So they're the largest body giraffe species. And they are the tallest animal on Earth. So you can see some of the variation here. Really wonderful. I think this is our big male. We have a big male here. Look at this. We have a look at him. This is really wonderful. Big male. So this species, of course, like other giraffes, is considered endangered. And the Maasai giraffe population, but in particular, oh, what was the other subspecies? Uh, giraffe, giraffe. Let's see. I'm trying to check here. Trip skilling. And Thorncrafty, that's the one. So the Thorncraft giraffe, that's what you'd call it. Uh, just making sure that was right. Um, the Maasai giraffe is considered endangered, and the population has declined about 52% in recent decades. And overall, the approximate population estimates of these guys is about 32,550 in the wild. And demographic studying these wild giraffes living inside and outside protected areas is uh, not the best. They suggest low adult survival outside uh, these protected areas because of poaching and uh, other things like that. And low calf survival rate inside due to predation and primary influences on their growth. So if they're in a protected area, the babies are not safe because of predators. There's a healthy ecosystem. But in these areas, the adults aren't safe because they are poached. So it's kind of a catch-22 there almost. But um, the survival of the giraffes uh, calves are influenced by the season of birth and the seasons, uh, seasonal local presence and abundance of the long-distance migratory herds of the wildebeest. And also a lot of metapopulation analysis indicates that protective, uh, protected areas were important in keeping giraffes on the larger landscape. That's always good. And they are kept by several... Uh, on several, uh, managed by several government agencies, such as the Cadian Wildlife Service, the Tanzania, Tanzania National Parks, and the Zambia Wildlife Authority. Also a bunch of non-government uh, things where they've been shown to affect giraffes, uh, protecting giraffes and making sure their babies here. We'll have a look at these babies. These babies grew up to be happy and healthy. They are very, very cute, aren't they? And um, there's also a few in captivity. They're kind of interbred. Because this uh, split of giraffe species is quite recent, there have been some that have been hybridized with other species or subspecies of giraffes. So it's not probably not the best, but it is what it is. So likely they are doing well in captivity. Uh, there's some that will have them and uh, they got pregnant and given birth, so they're doing okay. And a wonderful animal. I do like me some giraffes. Really weird to have like a really tall animal compared to the other ones. But yeah, awesome. Well, anyway, that was done by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. So our next one was also done by Leaf and Monsoon, who I actually found out is a former Zoo Tycoon modder. So he's kind of made his way into uh, Planet Zoo with a few mods like the Red uh, Shank Doc, I think his name was, and also some other ones that I'll be showing later. But still a really wonderful mod that he made. One of my favorite animals, actually. We have got the uh, prey. Oh, Kowapre. So a really wonderful animal here. So what is the Kowapre? It is the world's rarest bovid. It's very interesting. So it's a very uh, little known forest dwelling bovid that is native to Southeast Asia. And 
is considered critically endangered or possibly extinct, and I'll explain why. So, these guys are believed to be a close relative to animals like aurochs, uh, gar, and uh, bantang, and they're very large ungulates. They get to about the same size as the wild water buffalo, and they can reach up to 2.1 to 2.3 meters uh, along the head and body, and not counting the one meter tail, and stand about 1.7 to 1.9 meters tall, or 5 foot to 6 foot high at the shoulder. And their weight is reportedly from 680 to 110 kilos, so it's about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. But there have been unverified reports of individuals getting up to 1,700 kilograms or 3,700 pounds in Vietnam. But they are considered dubious, so we don't know. And we can see they're quite famous here for having these very tall, narrow bodies. And they actually be grey with dark brown or black spots. And the horns of the female are a little bit more uh, lithe, you can see here, more lithe shape. With like these upward spirals as you can see here and you can see the main difference between the female and the male the male also has a pretty distinctive dewlap like a lot of asian bovids so these guys uh, historically range from uh, cambodia southern laos eastern thailand and western vietnam and are thought to be extinct in all these areas sadly uh, outside of cambodia so they most likely only live in cambodia now in a bunch and in, in a few different sanctuaries there's been uh not that much looking into it but we'll have a look so they tend to live in uh low partially forest hills where they eat mainly grass and their preferred habitat is open forest and savanna often near thick monsoon forests they are also diurnal so they eat uh eating in the open at night um uh, and under the forest cover during the day so they come up to the open at night and in the day they'll go and find forest cover and they usually travel about 15 kilometers a day and they live in herds of up to 20 and they're usually led by a single female uh, the herds are generally consist of cows and calves but will have bulls during the dry season and older males will form bachelor herds and many herds have been known to break up and rejoin themselves as they travel and they've actually been found mixing with animals like bantang and wild buffalo so that's pretty interesting and as I mentioned, these guys, like other cattle and other bovids, they are mainly herbivores. They will feed on grasses, including bamboon, tolong, and coom. And they spend a lot of time around salt licks and water holes. So, as I mentioned, they are very, very rare. They are considered critically endangered and may actually be extinct, sadly. So, there is believed to be less than 250 uh, cooperate left in the world and they may be considered extinct. And these low numbers were considered, uh, were attributed to uncontrolled hunting by local soldiers for their meats and horns that were used, and skulls that were used in uh, traditional medicines, and uh, in conjunction with diseases imported from cattle, as, long as, as well as loss of habitat by uh, deforestation. So there's a lot of factors compounding to these poor guys' extinction. Let's just have a look at the coot car. So luckily they are legally protected in uh, all range states and may be present in some protected areas. So the last guys these guys was last time these guys were seen, I think was the last sighting was in 1983. I think that's the latest confirmed sighting. Uh, in 1988, yeah, they were the International Workshop of Corporate Conservation was had in Hanoi, and the workshop was kind of to get everyone to try and save them. So there's been a few large mammal surveys across Cambodia trying to rediscover these guys. The most recent one was in 2011 where they laid out camera traps, but sadly they did not find anything. So let's find our male here, there he is. But they are hoping to rediscover them. Uh, these surveys were done to determine the regions uh, in their range with the highest probability of finding them. And this is based on habitat and survey efforts to date. And during the last uh, decade, there's been a few searches, but they have proven to be fruitless. And there has been no co op sightings since 1983. And sadly, there is no captive populations, but there was one individual sent to Vinkira Zoo at Paris in 1937. And that individual is the holotype and died early during World War II. So you may be thinking, oh, it's a big animal, it might be extinct. But you think about it. A lot of these new species and rediscovered species are coming out of places that are poorly surveyed and Southeast Asia is definitely very poorly surveyed in terms of biodiversity and stuff. And we are finding species that have been rediscovered all the time. So it's very possible that a small population of these guys may be hanging on and especially in their habitat, it's very hard to traverse and also uh, 
just being rare on themselves can make them harder to find. So it's very, very possible they could still be around. And if you want to be the person to rediscover the Cobra, you can go to Cambodia yourself. And it's, I forgot to mention, they're actually the, uh, considered the national uh, mammal of Cambodia, I think. The national animal as well. So if you want to go find yourself a Cobra, I would not uh, tell you not to. They are really wonderful, and I think... Uh, rediscovering the co Prey would be one of the greatest discoveries of the decade, if not the next couple decades, so it'd be awesome. So, really wonderful species, and also some really nice conservation work would also be awesome. So yeah, now we're going to move on to the next animal. This was done by Bubbly Ones, who knows Jen Bubbly Ones, and Leaf. So, we have got the Fusa from Madagascar. The Fusa, the Fusa are coming. So yeah, wonderful little guy here, I love him. Really wonderful. So, the Fusa is uh, a carnivorous mammal. They belong to a group of um, Malagasy carnivores that are, I think that's called Elapuridae, uh, which are a family of carnivores that are closely related to mongoose that are only found in Madagascar. So they're endemic to Madagascar, and they are the largest mammalian carnivore found on Madagascar. And they have kind of evolved. This is a great example of convergent evolution. They almost look like a small cougar, and I think that's really, really cool. Um, they also re uh, co convergently evolve many cat-like features. You can see here, long tail, the snout here. They look very convenient, uh, convergently like a cat. And um, they're pretty big too. The adults can reach a, he a head-to-body length of about 70 to 80 centimeters, or 28 to 31 inches, and weigh between 5.5 and 8.6 kilos, or 12 to 19 pounds, with the males being larger than the females. Wait, what are you doing jumping about? Let's see if we can find the other one. There we are. Oh, that's not the one. Let's see if we get you. No, oh, that's not what I want. A bit finicky today, aren't we? There we are, wonderful. So, um, I mentioned those that they are generally uh, larger, males are larger than females. And they also have semi-retractable claws, which means they can retract them to an extent, but they cannot fully uh, retract their claws. And that allows them to climb down trees and climb up trees because they usually hunt levers and things. And they also support jumping from tree to tree. And there's also a close relative of these guys called the giant uh, uh, fossa that probably became extinct at about 1400. So these guys are very widespread across... Uh, Madagascar, the, the places there only really aren't found is the most inland areas, so they're pretty common. They're usually found in forested habitats where they usually hunt both day and night at low population densities. Their uh, diet mainly consists of lemurs, so the only endemic primates groups on the island. So mainly that's their main diet, that's about 50% of their diet. The rest consists of other animals such as tenrics, rodents, lizards, birds and other animals that have been documented as prey. And uh, mating usually occurs in trees uh, with horizontal limbs and can last for several hours. The litter size of these guys will often range from one to six pups and uh, are born blind and toothless or what you consider attritional. The infants are weaned at about four and a half months old and are independent about it after a year and sexual maturity for these guys occurs about three to four years of age. And uh, the life expectancy in captivity is about 20 years, and the wild is probably less, maybe 15 years. Uh, they're listed as a vulnerable species by the IUCN because of uh, they've generally feared by the Malagasy people and often protected by the Fadi Taboo. So they're luckily feared and obviously avoided by the Malagasy people. But their greatest threat is uh, habitat destruction, especially in Madagascar. There's a lot of big issues in Madagascar, especially around lemurs, so a lot of national parks being cut down. Also, uh, toxoplasmosis has been recorded in fossa, which is always not a good thing, um, along with other pathogens. But luckily, they, that's why they're considered endangered or vulnerable. I believe it's vulnerable yet, but hopefully some good conservation can be put in place to protect these guys, because they are... Wonderful examples of convergent evolution. I love convergent evolution. One of my favorite things to talk about. It's amazing how nature nature just loves plagiarizing itself. That's all it does. So yeah, we're going to be moving on from Fossa. That was done by Jen, Bubbly Ones, and Leaf. Now we're going to be moving on to one by The Boy Gaboy. So we got another cool little African mammal. And one, you'll recognize him. You'll see, you know him. I love Big Flopper. 
This is the big flopper himself. This is the Caracal. So, the Caracal is a medium-sized wildcat that is native to Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, and no arid areas of Northwestern India and Pakistan. So you can see here they're characteristic, uh, by, they're characterized by this very thick body that they have, robust uh, build, long legs, a short face, and these very long tuft ears, along with long canine teeth. And you can see its coat here is usually uh, reddish tan and pretty uniform or sandy. With the ventral parts you can see here that are lighter with small reddish markings, along with dark ears and a pretty lots of dark markings across the face. Really interesting, I love this guy. So um, they can reach about 40 to 50 centimeters at the shoulder and weigh between 8 and 19 kilograms or 18 to 24 pounds. And they are typically nocturnal. Uh, they are very highly secretive and difficult to observe. They're also territorial and live and mate in pairs, mainly in alone or in pairs. And also the caracal is a carnivore that typically preys upon small birds, uh, mammals and rodents. And it can actually, similar to the serval, they can leap to heights of about 4 meters to catch birds in mid-air. And they'll stalk this prey usually within 5 meters. Afterwards it will run down and kill it with a single bite. And you can see that both sexes are also sexually mature at about one year old and they will breed throughout the year. Gestation of these guys lasts about two to three months, resulting in litters of an offspring of about one to six cubs. Or kittens, actually, as you pronounce it. Um, juveniles also leave their mothers about nine to ten months uh, age. Though a few females will stay back uh, with their mothers. And the average lifespan of these guys is considered about 16 years. That's in captive caracals, but obviously in the wild it's probably a bit shorter. So I mentioned pretty good guys. They live in like all sorts of different habitats such as uh, savannas, lowlands, deserts, uh, scrub forests. Uh, they even found in the Ethiopian highlands, which is pretty interesting. They maintain territories that are average about 220 square kilometers, uh, the males will, but the females have much smaller territories of about 57 square kilometers, or about 80, uh, 22 miles. As I mentioned, they eat pretty much everything. They will feed on like uh, young uh, kudu, uh, bushbucks, uh, springbok as well. They'll also eat rocks, hyraxes, hares, birds, just anything they can find. And as I mentioned, they are pretty good jumpers, so they use it to catch birds out of mid-air. Really wonderful animals. And the threats of these guys, they're likely considered least concern, as they have a wide distribution. But there are threats to different caracal populations. We'll have a look at the baby while we're talking about the threats. Really wonderful cute baby. Um, a lot of the threats that these guys have is such as um, agricultural expansion that can cause habitat loss. Buildings of roads and settlements can cut off populations. And actually thought to be close to extinction in North Africa, critically endangered in Pakistan, and endangered in Jordan but stable in Central and Southern Africa, so that's good. Lots of people, uh, local peoples will also kill caracals as they believe to be a threat to their livestock or retaliation and preying on their livestock. And they're also threatened by the hunting and predating trade on the pet trade in the Arabian Peninsula. And in Turkey and Iran, caracals are frequently killed in road accidents, sadly. And also in Uzbekistan, their main threat is being killed by herders in retaliation for livestock. And where they've been using guarding techniques to try and prevent this. So yeah, still a wonderful little species. I love caracals. How can you not love Big Flopper? His mum, I think. I love Big Flop. I love the tufts of the ears. Such beautiful animals. So, last but most definitely not least, we've got another mod bound by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. We have got um, a monkey this time, or an ape. We have got one of the coolest animals. We have got the mountain gorilla. So we'll have a look at the male here. The big silverback. Big boy, I love him. So, the mountain gorilla is a subspecies of the eastern gorilla. So is Gorilla Berengi Berengi, and are listed in, as endangered by the IUCN. And uh, there are two populations of these guys. There's one found in the Varonga Mountains in Central Africa, Africa, and in another population in southwest Uganda. Uh, they're, they're both considered, uh, they're different populations, but they are considered the same subspecies. And as of June 2018, there were more than a thousand individuals, so there's very good conservation work that's been going on for the mountain gorillas. So these guys uh, split from, they've been isolated from eastern lowland gorillas for about 10,000 years and these, they split from their western counterparts, or the western uh, gorillas species, about 3 million years ago. 
and you can see the visually you can often see the difference between the eastern uh and western gorillas is the eastern gorillas generally have a lot uh thicker fur especially compared to because they live in colder temperatures and these guys also get pretty big being gorillas they are huge they're one of the biggest primate they can get to a standing height of about 161 to 171 7 centimeters with a girth of about 138 to 163 centimeters so that's 63 to 67 inches and also six, uh, 54 to 64 inches and they have an arm span about 2 to 2.7 meters or 6 foot 7 to 8 foot 10 and weigh between 120 to 191 kilograms or 265 to 241 pounds so that's about the size of a uh silverback or a large male gorilla the females are literally uh li normally a bit smaller they will weigh between 70 to 98 kilograms or 154 to 216 pounds and they are smaller than the eastern lowland gorilla and the other which is the other species of the eastern gorilla and uh the main difference as you can see is kind of they're just a little bit smaller they also got a bit of a pronounced uh what do you call it uh temporalis muscles so yeah they, they attach to the large uh skull here the sagittal crest the bottom there but they are very very big the tallest uh, silverbacks have been recorded about 195 uh, centimeters with an arm span of 2.7 uh, meters or uh, 6 foot 5 and 8 foot 10 so they're, they're some very large gorillas that's a very large individual so these guys are also primarily territorial and quadrupedal as you can see uh, they will climb to catch fruits uh, if they if the branches can carry their weight of course and they, unlike humans, and like most other great apes, they have limbs, uh, front limbs that are longer than their uh, back limbs, or arms longer than their legs, which they can use, obviously, for grasping and things and climbing. So their habitat includes uh, the Alduri Rift uh, Cloud Forest, and includes the Varonga Volcanoes, and they range in altitude from 2,200 to uh, 4,300 meters, or 7,000 to 14,000 feet. And where they live on these slopes of these volcanoes with like heavy vegetation since they're volcanic a lot of healthy soils there the mountain gorilla is primarily a herbivore so they have the majority of their diet is uh, composed of leaves shoots and stems but they will also feed on flowers fruit and smaller vertebrates and they will eat on average about 18.8 kilograms a day for a male while the females will eat 14 kilograms That's what we're talking about then we'll have a look at a female a wonderful female here so the home ranges of these guys are obviously influenced by food sources and usually include several uh, vegetation zones. So they usually found, they would usually just go where the food is. And uh, they are very highly social, like other gorillas. They live in stable, um, cohesive groups where there's long-term bonds between males and females. But the relationship among females is relatively weak. So like other gorilla species, uh, they will have a male silverback that kind of tells everyone what to do and mates with other females that he will defend his troop from predators but also uh, other males that want to mate with his females so that's kind of how they work and you get the name silverback because gorillas have when they lead a tribe or a group of other gorillas they get this silverback here and if they're not uh, if they're gorilla living by themselves or in small batch of the groups they'll be called blackbacks so yeah, really wonderful so uh the story about these guys is really really sad though so the population here has been grown to now over a thousand individuals they used to be uh it was really really sad they used to be like only a few hundred but due to the population because obviously they live in a african country so there is often wars in these areas but also a lot of the issues that were compounding these guys they were just almost threat of extinction there was a lot of issues with poaching especially if you hear the stories of like people dealing with poachers habitat loss also disease from tourists so people that come to see the gorillas they would get uh, in, uh diseases that they weren't exposed to from people also a lot of war and unrest and local commuters didn't like them and they were like hunting them off their land because they come and raid uh, agriculture which sucks and they're also quite common for bushmeat so that's another big issue for them so luckily there's been very very good conservation efforts so in like the early 90s pretty much there was only a few hundred left and there have been uh, lots of rangers a lot of rangers have actually given their lives to protect these species so we got that to thank for the uh, continued existence of the mountain gorillas which is so very sad but they're so very wonderful so um yeah 
We're so lucky to have these guys. Also, tourism's really saved the species because they make a lot of money for the local economy. So a lot of people are proud to have the gorillas. And due to that, their population has gone to only from a few hundred to now. They're over a thousand. And I believe they're still growing, so they are relatively protected. The big issues I can see is potentially climate change and more political unrest. It seems to have died down a bit now, but obviously with politics it can be an issue. But still a really wonderful species. We'll have a look at a baby while we're talking about them. I'm pretty sure they have... what's their gestation period? They don't have a very uh, long gestation period. They have one... I think it's pretty similar to humans. And they grow up, so yeah. Males will leave the group at about 11 years old as well. Yeah, really wonderful. So, look at these cute little babies. Really cute. So, I think we are going to move on from uh, this. This is going to be part 35. So, I think we've a good place to end here. So, yeah. I really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to click the little bell icon to get notified when I upload anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye